Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for the opportunity for me to speak to you about the experience of being a Jewish refugee from Iran. If you ask me to describe myself, I could tell you that I'm a woman, a mother, a judge, an American. But what I feel most these days is a Persian Jew, a Jew twice exiled. I was born in Iran, the oldest Jewish community outside the land of Israel. We trace our roots to the Babylonian exile, where many of the Jews living in Eretz Israel were forcibly deported after the destruction of the first temple. And here I am in New York, amongst the largest Jewish community in the world, outside the modern state of Israel. But somehow I feel like I did living back in Tehran. The, br the brutality and the grief of the past eight weeks and the reaction of the world around us harkens to the dark days following the Islamic revolution in Iran, which I lived through as a young girl. It was never easy being a Jew in Iran, even before the revolution. Jews throughout the Muslim world were designated as dhimis, second-class citizens. In Iran, we were restricted to ghettos or mahalles and labeled as najes. Najes is a word so, so incomprehensible. It's a word that's beyond dirty or impure. It means that when it was raining outside, Jews could not walk in the street because it was thought that the impurity of the Jew would transfer over to the Muslims on the street. Or it meant that when there were water tanks traveling through the cities, Jews had to be the last ones online to draw water for their families. Or it meant that if you went to the grocery store, you could not touch the fruit before buying it. But by the time I was born in Iran in 1969, when Iran was ruled by Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the Jewish community could carve out a relatively safe space to live as long as they remembered their place in a country that was moving towards modernity. The Shah sought to bring Iran into the modern world and to be a leader on the world stage. He had diplomatic relations with Israel and used the knowledge and skill of Israeli companies in all aspects of the modernization effort. It was thus that my father worked with multiple Israeli companies throughout his career in Iran from raising poultry on a small farm to building highways and dams deep in the desert. And my family and many other Jewish families joined the rising middle class in Iran. We had our own synagogues, public, publicly funded day schools, which I attended, and other social institutions. We even had a Jewish representative in the Iranian parliament. We knew our place, mind you, but we could live and breathe. Then the revolution happened, and it truly revolutionized Jew hatred. Seemingly overnight, my birthplace transformed from a country coming into the modern age to a regressive society, from a country that respected women and valued education and science, to a country where women are second-class citizens and chattels of men where being gay is a crime punishable by execution, where young women are rounded up by the morality police, where corruption runs rampant, and where religious minorities are persecuted. And the worst thing you can be is a Zionist. And for the crime of being labeled a Zionist, a leader of the Iranian Jewish community, Mr. Habib al Ghanayan was summarily executed and hanged in the early days of the Islamic Revolution in May of 1979. It was clear that Jews were no longer safe in Iran, especially anyone who could be labeled a Zionist. My family had just celebrated my brother's bar mitzvah in Israel, and my father's connections and business dealings with the Israeli companies in Iran made him a likely target by the new revolutionary Islamist powers. Thus, my family was amongst the first wave of Jews to leave Iran. Here in New York, we could let our guard down. 
We no longer had to hide our Jewish identity and in fact proudly wore our Jewish star or high necklaces like I'm wearing tonight. In the months and years after we left Iran, the majority of this ancient community of 80,000 Jews also left Iran. Most headed for the US and Israel, often smuggled out or through the purchase of a Muslim passport. Today, maybe 10,000 Jews remain in what had been our home of 2,500 years. During this time, the freedom of the Jewish community was restricted bit by bit. For years, Jews could not leave the country at all. Now they can exit only by putting up collateral for their return. Jewish schools were eventually shut down. Jews are restricted from entering certain professions, such as the law. And every time there's a conflict in Israel, the Jews of Iran are paraded in front of the cameras like prisoners of war denouncing the Zionist state, including just a couple of weeks ago. It is sad and heartbreaking for me to see the same fundamentalist ideology that stormed the American embassy in 1979 and took diplomats hostage has been exported to Gaza and Lebanon and elsewhere. Literally, and these same people literally funded and trained by, this, by the same regime to rape, murder, torture, and kidnap Jews. It is even more heartbreaking to see legit legitimization of these barbaric acts and the delegitimization de of the Jewish state not just by the uneducated thugs, but by many at elite universities. How easily they have embraced their roles as the pawns of a sadistic totalitarian regime hell-bent on suppressing its own citizens and destroying the Jewish state. The Islamic Republic of Iran is both the world's largest sponsor of terrorism and its most prolific propagator of anti-Semitism. Iran is a place where one can turn on state-run TV and be told that Israelis kill Arab children for their organs. Jew hatred is not a bug of the Iranian regime, it's a feature. The speed at which people turned out in the streets, on social media, and everywhere in between to denounce Israel and to declare their exhilaration before Israel had even buried its dead is astonishing. The first anti-Israel rally in New York City was held the day after the massacres on October 8th. Astonishing, that is, if you have not lived through the Iranian revolution and seen how overnight friends and neighbors with whom you felt safe began to express negative feelings towards Jews and Israel, and how Ayatollah Khomeini was seen as the great social justice warrior who would heal all of Iranian society's ills. Despite all this, I will not go back into hiding. I will not hide my Jewish star necklace. And I will not let my freedom as a Jew or my deep and immutable connection to the land, to the people and state of Israel be taken from me again. And neither must you. I fight for this freedom in many ways. For the last four years, it has been as chair of a Jewish bar association where we bring Jewish lawyers and judges together for education, collaboration, with other communities within our sphere of engagement, the justice system. But I think perhaps my most important contribution to the fight against anti-Semitism that is informed by my experience as an Iranian Jewish refugee is my role as a judge. The impartial and honest application of the law is the surest safeguard against anti-Semitism and every other ism. The rule of law is what stands between civil society and mob rule, between blood libels and the truth. So too, everyone here must stand up for the Jewish community in every way they can. 
I implore every institution in this great country of ours, every school, every college, every employer, every newspaper, and every court, to combat the anti-Semitic, anti-Zionism with every lawful tool at their disposal. To allow anti-Semitism to flourish is to deny the rule of law and vice versa. I've seen that movie before. It doesn't end when for the, it does not end well for the Jews. It doesn't end well for anyone. I am proud to be an Iranian American Jew. I am proud to be a Zionist. And I am very thankful for this opportunity to speak to you tonight to remind everyone about the once flourishing Jewish community of Iran. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>